cool. Um, great. So Polyjuice uh, is a paper published um, this year in, in Usenix. And the whole idea of it is to learn concurrency control algorithms for like specific transactions and transaction types, essentially. Uh, so the basic idea is that like a single concurrency control method isn't necessarily optimal for all transactions the database will pro process. So the basic idea with the concurrency control algorithm is we want to prevent uh, transactions from violating the integrity of the database, right? So um, we, but in so doing, we still want to maximize the transactional throughput on the database. So we basically want something that's both safe and fast. So uh, the authors state that the primary source of latency at this point in a database is really the concurrency control algorithm rather than disk access due to just improved disk performance. So like, so the two classic examples of concurrency control are optimistic concurrency control and, and two-phase locking. Uh, optimistic concurrency control is, uh, I'm sure like many of you probably heard of, but like a, the basic idea is that you uh, you write ahead into the, the log and then sort of like, uh, hopefully, and then eventually go back and try and fix what you've broken. And there's a bunch of different ways to, to solve this problem. Uh, so the author is basically decomposed concurrency control uh, into uh, a set of possible variables you can tweak in a concurrency control protocol. So, uh, so there's a, they, the concept of a read control. So basically there are two possible things that they would change and that is uh, where, like, uh, what to wait for, okay? Uh, and whether or not to wait. So uh, block, so we basically block the current transaction until a prior construction uh, transaction, sorry, uh, completes a write. Uh, and then we can also tweak whether or not to read just committed data or to read uncommitted data as well. Uh, write control, so uh, block till a prior transaction completes a write, uh, and whether or not we will make available written data uh, to subsequent reads. So basically, we would then allow subsequent reads to read our uncommitted data. Uh, and then additionally, how to validate and when to validate. So it doesn't actually, the, the frame, uh, so the, the database polyjuice doesn't actually support all types of concurrency control and doesn't, doesn't support like one of the more famous, and I, I believe more popular types of concurrency control, um, MVCC, multi-version concurrency control. Uh, technically it's expressible in the framework they developed for describing concern, concurrency control algorithms but their database was not able to support it because they didn't actually maintain multiple versions of data in order to be able to do multiple version concurrency control. Cool, um, so the algorithm, so for, to be a supported algorithm in this uh, database, you must execute the transaction on a single thread uh, and you cannot support predefined dependencies within a globally agreed order prior to execution uh, because the framework interleaves data access at runtime. And so basically that negates uh, concurrency control protocols like Kelvin, which is in use in, uh, uh, I know for a fact it's in use in FaunaDB, uh, which is a sort of like a, they don't support SQL yet, but they have like a GraphQL interface and their own specialized query, query language. And definitely worth checking out. Cool. Uh, uh, so uh, the learning process here, they talk a lot in terms of reinforcement learning in the paper. It's technically using an evolutionary algorithm, but like the, the overall thrust and how they explain their algorithm is, is very much geared towards the language of 
reinforcement learning. And the basic idea is that we want to take basically our, we, we have a, we want to learn a policy and, we, and that policy maps the perceived state of a system to the, uh, the, the perceived state of the environment to actions. So in this case, we want to take the current state of the database and then convert it into a set of actions that represent the concurrency control protocol. So our reward is maximizing transaction throughput. And the environment is the current transaction workload and system setup and operation. So we, we blend these two ideas. So we're effectively able to learn new concurrency control algorithms and to find the best possible concurrency control algorithms uh, via offline training on historic data we've gathered about the system. So we're essentially, we're applying this evolutionary algorithm, uh, learning the best concurrency control algorithm uh, and new concurrency control algorithms as we collect data or from historic data we have about an existing database. Uh, so, the, so for this to work, we really need to have like some kind of perceivable pattern within our transactions. So like you can't have a functionally random set of transactions and then learn anything valuable, um, which seems like fairly obvious, but it's something that the authors pointed out that like in lo like a largely random workload, this this database will perform worse than, uh, than a database that purely uses, let's say, optimistic concurrency control. So, so functionally, like they're only really validating this against databases that have some level of contention. Um, if you have no contention, then uh, I believe optimistic concurrency control would just dominate, um, given that it only checks after it's committed. Uh, it's, only, it's only really checking in that, so that last possible situation. Um, or even no concurrency control would obviously win because we have no contention. Uh, so like other, other work in this space has basically uh, tried to find uh, shards, essentially like subsets and then apply a specific algorithm to a subset, but it's not very fine grained. It's kind of coarse grained or like pick an area to apply a concurrency control algorithm to, but that will contain maybe uh, sets of transactions that would have been better with a different concurrency control algorithm. So what this work has done is it's basically learned a, a very fine grained approach to handling concurrency control. So the architecture of the system is somewhat simple. Uh, the idea is that the Polyjuice database runs on a node. And then there is a separate node that handles offline learning. So we have this box here. So the client sends requests to a transaction engine. The transaction engine takes this transaction, looks up in the learned policy table to find the set of actions that should apply for this transaction. And then it will perform access on the storage layer get out the result and ship it back to the client. Uh, and throughout this process, it's shipping off the transactions it's receiving to the offline learning component. And the offline learning will keep training and then updating the learned policy table. Okay, so the policy table is essentially where, where the magic happens. We have uh, a fairly large number of uh, so for each column, we have a, uh, a possible action. Uh, and then the row space is the possible set of states the system can be in. So you will look up for a transaction type uh, and essentially the current state of the system, uh, a set of actions that you should perform. Cool, so the, the policy state space is uh, one, the type of transaction being executed and which access of the transaction is being executed. And so an access, I, I believe would be either a read or a write. Uh, the size of the state space is equivalent to the sum of all the data accesses for all the modeled transactions. 
cool. Uh, then we have the action space, which is essentially the column space. Uh, so we have this concept of interleaving control. So uh, waiting before, uh, uh, before a, a read or write, uh, a read version. So like either reading clean or dirty data, uh, dirty meaning uncommitted and, and clean normally meaning committed, uh, write visibility. So after a write access, it can be private or public. So if it's public, then you're enabling dirty reads of that data. And you can also do validation early after any read or write. And validation is essentially checking to see if that is a correct or valid uh, read or write. Cool, so the size of the action space is a product of all of these statements. So uh, the number of weight choices, and that is the product of the number of static data accesses for each transaction and cardinality. Uh, and then we're doubling for the read version and read version being clean or dirty, uh, write visibility, so private or public, um, early validation, yes or no. So the policy space is exponentially large. Uh, so we need to efficiently find a good policy for a given workload. They used a, a type of, uh, sort of genetic algorithm effectively, of evolutionary algorithm, I should say, sorry. Uh, and essentially fairly standard algorithm. You create an initial population of policies. You test the throughput of each policy. You select uh, N individuals with the, the best throughput to bring to the next round, and then you mutate them uh, based on a probability, and then you ship them back to test the throughput. And you can keep running this until you arrive at a point where you think you've found the optimal policies. And obviously, I think, uh, just to state clearly, um, I don't believe that there is any, I don't, I don't, as far as I know, no one has yet proved that evolutionary algorithms will ever converge on an optimal state. So you can trivially get caught in like a, just a local lower bound. You won't necessarily find like the global best case. Cool, so the mutation of the policy is configurable by our hyperparameter hyper uh, for the probability that, some, that it will mutate, right? Uh, and the things that we can vary are either Ninja values uh, over like a uniform sampled uh, by with a uniform sampled integer from an interval defined by another hyperparameter called lambda. So there's two hyperparameters, uh, probability p and and lambda. Lambda telling you like the the uh, inclusive space that you can sample an integer in, and uh, p telling you the probability that you'll want to change something in the policy. Uh, and then we can also flip Boolean values between true and false, right? Uh, they did try crossover, which is just another like evolutionary algorithm technique where you try to blend policies uh, and they found that to just not work properly. They also tested like classical reinforcement learning um, and found that also to be quite ineffective. Cool, um, here is like, so the top line results. So comparing against other databases with like number of active threads and number of warehouses. So they found that Polyjuice was able to outperform some databases, but not necessarily under all conditions, right? So we can see that Silo uh, with uh, Silo and CC with very large numbers of warehouses will outperform Polyjuice, uh, but they saw that if you look at the uh, bottom graph that for a single warehouse and you're, and you're purely increasing the number of threads, Polyjuice would perform very well um, and outperform significantly uh, other databases. Cool. Um, so that was a fairly short talk. Um, I'm gonna stop my share now. Thanks so much.